Mr. Nixon. Mr. Chief Justice, <clears throat> may it please the court. I believe that the fundamental issue here cannot be determined unless there is a judgment with regard to the facts. Uh, there has been discussion to the effect that the truth or falsity of the life article is not material and should not raise a constitutional question. But if the court would permit, I would like to present the facts as we see them for a moment. And in doing so, let me read from the reply brief of the defendant. The desperate hours, in a very fundamental way, was a reenactment of the Hill incident. And the Life article was accurate, and substantially more accurate than it needed to be to gain First Amendment protection. And later on, the differences are superficial differences. Now, as my argument will develop, if those statements or conclusions are correct, this decision by the Court of New York should be reversed, both on constitutional grounds and also, I would say parenthetically, that this case would not qualify for liability under the law of New York. Let us turn to the facts for a moment. Was this a reenactment? Now, the court has some primary documents which it can examine to answer that question. There are four of them. One, the life article. Two, the play. Three, the current news accounts, which are in the record, written at the time the play came out. And four, an article by the author, written at the time the play came out, indicating his view as to whether the play was a reenactment. Looking to the point of whether the play was a reenactment, however, I think it is fundamentally necessary for us to get away from the superficial, and I would state that they are those, similarities or differences as far as the cast of characters in the stage setting are concerned. Uh, it doesn't make any difference uh, whether or not it happens that the Hill family, there were five children, and in the fictional family there were two children. It doesn't make any difference that this incident may have taken place in early fall or late fall, uh, that in the Hill incident it occurred in Philadelphia, and that in the fictional incident it occurred in Indianapolis, or that the house in the Hill case was a three-story house, and the house in the case of the fictional story, it was a two-story house. All of those factors, whether they are similarities or differences, relate to the cast of characters and to the stage setting. And as the member of this court, I think, will agree, the cast of characters and stage setting tell us no more about a play than a picture frame tells us about a portrait or a painting. The question with regard to the portrait is, what's on the canvas? And the key question with regard to the play, what took place in the play? What went on? Now on that point, we have some primary evidence, and it comes directly from the article itself. Mr. Nixon, how is the yes. play relevant here? That is to say, uh, is it your uh, theory that the Life article, by referring to the play, uh, brings the entire text of the play into operation for legal purposes as if it were a part of the Life article? Mr. Justice Portis, the reading of the Life article can lead to no conclusion except that those individuals who go to the play, playing at the Barrymore Theater at that time, would see a reenactment of an incident which happened to the hills. A reading of the article and of the pictures, which of course are the heart of the article, would lead to that conclusion. Well, you are in effect then saying that uh, uh, 
the purposes of this case, one must read the article as if it included the text of the play. I'm saying that for the purposes of this case, life told its readers that the play was a reenactment of the Hill incident, and that that was the message that life got across, and therefore the play therefore becomes quite material to the facts of the case. Well, the reader gets the impression that seeing the play, he's going to see something that happened to the hills, whereas in fact, what he sees when, the see when he sees the play is not what happened to the hills, is that it? Exactly. What I am saying is that when we look at the hill incident and the play, we have incidents that instead of being similar, except as for the cast of characters in the stage setting are concerned, are as far apart as they could possibly be. Let's look at the Hill incident for a moment. What made it a particularly unusual hostage instance? What made it a particularly unusual hostage incident was the fact that it had an absence of violence. As Mrs. Hill pointed out, the convicts acted like perfect gentlemen, and Time magazine, in a current news report, facetiously said, and titled its account, House Party, because of a complete lack of violence. Now, what made the play a hit? It wasn't the fact that it was just about hostage instances, or that because it happened to relate to the Hill incident, which it didn't. But what made the play a hit was that it took an old theme, as the New York Times Review pointed out, which many times had been written about in plays and novels, and that the author, quoting again from the New York Times Review, melt the last drop of horror from this macabre situation. So you have the Hill incident, distinguished by the fact that it lacked violence completely, and you have the play, A Three-Day Reign of Terror. But now let's see what life did with it. What, what would have been your position if the Life article had been 100% accurate? but had brought into its commentary about the play the name of the Hill family without its consent. Under those circumstances, Mr. Justice Harlan, there would be no liability under the law of New York. Because under the law of New York, and this is where the problem of falsity and truth is very important, under the law of New York, the test of whether an article is for purposes of trade depends upon fictionalization. If it is a true account of a newsworthy event, then even though it goes back many, many years, referring earlier to Mr. Justice Fortas's question, then a true account incurs no liability. But it's only when the publisher falsifies, fictionalizes the term that is used in the New York cases, the relationship between a past event and the plaintiff, and falsifies for the purpose of purposes of trade in order, of course, to make it a more newsy, saleable article. It is then only that liability incurs. And do you get that, uh, you don't get that from the statute, you get it from the cases, I assume. Mr. And, Justice uh, Fortas, the statute states basically liability on the basis of two tests. One, advertising, which is relatively clear, the use of an ad. Even there, there are exceptions. <clears throat> but second, for the purposes of trade. Now, if for purposes of trade had not been over a period of 60 years been very narrowly interpreted by the New York statutes to include only those instances where there had been falsification amounting to fictionalization, this statute, I believe, would be subject to constitutional question. Mm. What, what, what case are you uh, relying on? Your... Well, the New York cases, going back over a period of years, have held that where there is a true account, a true account of a past situation, that there is no liability. The leading case in that respect is the Citus case, uh, a case uh, which involved actually a very sad situation, um. a genius, who was newsworthy at the time, giving instructions when he was 11 years of old to people in higher mathematics at Harvard, and then 
with the sensitivities sometimes characteristic of genius, uh, retreating into private life. A quarter of a century later, dug up by the New Yorker magazine, uh, and a story written about him. The story entitled April Fool. He'd been born on April Fool's Day. And yet the New York court, an indication of its concern for the First Amendment in this case, refused to hold the publication liable on the ground that it was a true account of what had been a newsworthy event and in which there was still an interest in news. That's, yeah. That's right. Now, whatever, whatever that uh, might be, I suppose uh, you would agree that so far as we're concerned, uh, we will have to take it that the question of liability under the New York statute is foreclosed, and the question before us is the, its impact upon First Amendment rights. I would say that as far as the question of liability is concerned, uh, that question is foreclosed, if I understand your question. Uh, that question is foreclosed uh, insofar as any report that is true. On that particular point, it is clear that the New York cases lay down a very strict test that there can be no liability without fictionalization. Let me try to clarify. Yes, sir. Uh, Citus uh, dealt with the question of statutory construction in New York. Citus does not deal with the First Amendment impact of the statute on its face or as applied. Is that correct? Not specifically, except, except I would say there was a relationship to it, Mr. Justice Forrest. There may be a sense. relationship, but there's, I don't uh, read Citus, uh, I don't recall that Citus discusses a uh, First Amendment problem. That was an opinion by Judge Clark. Uh, True. But I would say that when you read all of the cases in New York, going back over 60 years, it will be found that the New York courts recognize that if, for the pur if the phrase, for purposes of trade, were interpreted in a broad sense to mean that any time a publisher took a newsworthy item, and used it for purposes of increasing circulation, that that would be an invasion of privacy. The New York courts recognized that that would run into First Amendment problems. Well, I, you, and I think that is, I would say, that while that may not have been specifically uh, mentioned from a constitutional standpoint in CITES, I believe that that was the basis for the court's conclusion in CITES. Yes. May I get... No, but I think the point is that, perhaps the point is that uh, this, uh, are you saying that to us, that in your judgment, unless we conclude that the uh, uh, judgment of the New York Court of Appeals was based on uh, the falsity of the article, then we must conclude that this is a violation of the First Amendment. Is that your position? Mr. Justice Fortas, in my view, Where we have in this new field of the law, in which this court has not yet spoken, where we have a situation of a newsworthy event, even though there has been a passage of time, and then a state attempting to protect the right of privacy, I believe that you would run into very difficult constitutional questions in the event that liability incurred when the account was truthful. I believe that the New York test, which provides for liability only if there's a combination of three circumstances, one, the use of the proper name, two, a fictionalized account, primary and substantial insofar as the statement is concerned, and three, fictionalizing for the purposes of trade, which means falsehood for commercial purposes. I, excuse, yes. I noticed the Court of Appeals, well, I always had a difficulty, I must say, practicing this Court of Appeals, but here they affirmed on the opinion both of Judge Justice Stevens and the concurring opinion of Justice Raven. So I gather when Justice Raven says this, the difficulty with the position of the defendant's time is that it portrayed the previous two incidents in a highly sensational manner and represented that the play was a true version of that event. It was not 
It was fictionalized and duly so found. Consequently, it violated Section 1 of the Civil Rights Law, citing Gallier, Maloney, and Lahiri. You want us to say that this case comes to us with a finding that Section 51, first of all, is limited, to, at least as applied here, to liability because this was fictionalized and duly so found. And that in First Amendment context, we must accept this as a determination based on a this finding that this is a fictionalized version of the Hill Is that it? The narrow finding in this case in New York and the state of the facts before the court here today is the use of false statements to invade privacy for purposes of trade and only in the event that it was a fictionalized account. And I go further. Not only must it be fictionalized, it must be primary. The individual who sues must be the primary subject of the account. And as far as the fictionalization is concerned, it must impair the essential accuracy of the whole account. And you're telling us that the New York case is indeed limited to statutes of application where those three things appear. Mr. Justice Brennan, that is exactly the point. The New York cases, because of their concern in my point, in my opinion, and I will agree with Mr. Justice Fortas, they may not specifically have referred to this in each instance. But because of their concern for First Amendment considerations, the New York cases have said that purposes of trade requires a fictionalized account. Otherwise, you would have a situation where any publisher would be liable for publishing news. And that would be certainly a violation of the First Amendment. Yes, Mr. Justice Fortas. If it comes to us in that posture, are we to understand that New York does not draw a distinction for purposes of liability under the privacy law between stories about past events which are false or which are knowingly false and stories which are not known to be false at the time they're published but actually are false? Let's assume here, for example, that the author had told the life reporter that it is a true enactment. In other words, the life reporter really had no good reason to believe otherwise. New York, I suppose, under its rule, would impose liability whether life knew the story was false or not. We get there, Mr. Justice White, as to whether or not, in the case there has been fictionalization, there should be the element of malice in the test of the Sullivan New York Times case. I would say that in this particular case, looking at the facts of this case, that there was knowledge. I know you say that, but how about the purposes of New York law? And under New York law, it would be my view that in the event that the author had told the life reporter that it was a true enactment, there would be liability for that in the event of lack of knowledge, in the event that there was fictionalization in the sense of staging, not a current news story. Let me make clear, Mr. Medina has referred to several current news stories. There is no New York case that has held liability in 60 years for a current news story. In every instance, fictionalization has required a passage of time. It has required staging. It has required contrivance. Now, your case would be one where you had staging, there had been a passage of time, and it was a contrived situation, but the individual did it in good faith, believing that it was correct, and yet it was false. In my view, he would be liable under the case of New York, but that was not the finding in this case. No. As the New York statute comes to us, however, it would cover the situation where the story about the past event was false, but it was only negligently false, for example. We might say that it was an excusable error, but it was nevertheless false. You would say New York would impose liability in that case. Mr. Justice White, I believe New York would impose liability in such a case. I know of no New York case where that has happened. I recognize what the Justice is getting at, that this is a possibility for the future, but let me make one thing very clear. Well, I'm suggesting that under the case of this Court, that sometimes statutes have been invalidated because they're overbroad. Well, let me come back, though, to the fundamental point. The New York cases require fictionalization. It is very difficult for me to think of a state of facts in which there has been a passage of time, fictionalization requires that, 
in which there is staging, in which the individual whose name is used without his consent is the primary subject, and in which the fictionalization is, uh, impairs the essential accuracy, where that could happen without knowledge. And I would say that it would amount, Mr. Justice White, if not to knowledge, certainly to reckless disregard. Because uh, the fictionalization is a conscious act. Fictionalization under the New York cases is conscious. You have put a hypothetical case, uh, which I do not think could ever happen. Uh, but my view is that since fictionalization connotes conscious knowledge, that this means that you would either have conscious knowledge or certainly at the very least a reckless disregard of the facts which you had here in any event. Could I, could I spend one moment with regard to the differences between this play because the, the point of fictionalization becomes critical. If this play was a reenactment, a substantial reenactment, then there is a constitutional problem here. Now, the members of this court know Life magazine, that it tells its stories through pictures. And also the members of this court are aware of the fact that Life magazine, being the most popular of the picture magazines, does not use pictures that relate superficial events. They go to the heart of the case. Now, the court has on, in its record, it's the first piece of evidence, it has the life story. And if you will take your attention for the moment to the pictures, there are six which are used in this article. Now understand, this is the article about the play which the appellant says is a reenactment in which the differences are superficial. There are six pictures. The picture in the first page, two convicts in the living room harangue the daughter while the mother, Nancy Coleman, watches helplessly. That didn't happen in the Hill incident. Go to the second page, entitled Two Crime, Three Christ at the Back Door. And the picture there, at the real house where the family was trapped, the actors do seen from the play. Here, daughter Cindy stalls off her bow from entering the home. That didn't happen did to the Hills. I didn't get that. Would you uh, repeat what that caption, please? Mr. Chief Justice. Cindy stalls off her bow from entering the home at the real house. Yes. Now, Cindy is the daughter, and she stalls off her bow. Later on, her bow, incidentally, gets into the house and is wounded in this play, which Mr. Medina has characterized as not having any particularly ugly factors. Then the next picture on that page. A brave try to save the family fails when the father has to toss out a gun because the son is held as hostage. That didn't happen in the Hill incident. There were no heroics on the part of the son or the father or the daughter or any other member of the family. And then the next picture. The first hope for rescue comes when a trash collector chats with a wife and senses something is wrong. He is killed in the play, but his death puts the police on the trail. That didn't happen to the Hills. No trash collector came to the house. No one was killed, not the trash collector, not the two convicts who were killed in the play, and no one was wounded, as was the boyfriend. Now let's go to the next page. And here we find Robich, the brutish convict. If the court will look at the, there, it says, brutish convict rushed up the young son, Ralphie, who shows his spunk by talking up to the criminals. Incidentally, as we look at that picture, you can look at Appellant's brief and note that the violence was rather mild, but I submit that roughing up is certainly can't be characterized as less than violence, and I think less than ugly. And then the next picture, daring daughter bites the hand of the youngest convict. That didn't happen in the play. And then finally, this was the critical point of the play. Feverish father cleverly foists off unloaded gun on the leader, Paul Newman, saves his son, saves the family. The convicts are killed as a result of this brilliant move in his part. But did they, is six, it all that of any consequence, Mr. Nixon? Let us say, basic fact is that uh, Life magazine sent photographers out there and they staged these incidents. That's right, isn't it? 
That's now correct. Suppose that the incidents had been staged with absolute fidelity to the actual events in, uh, that involved the Hill family. Uh, this is a kind of problem that we have to explore, I yes, think. Sir. And uh, uh, would that have uh, 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 had any bearing upon whether this is First Amendment, whether this uh, statute is applied? violates First Amendment. That is said, would still have been a fictionalization. And that's important, I take it, according to your argument, for the purpose of taking it out of the category of news, whatever bearing that may have. Now, if you have, does the truth or falsity or the specific uh, uh, accuracy in portraying specific events have a bearing on this? Or isn't the operative, or is it that the operative fact is whether they took existing news items from the morgue, let's say, or on the other hand, went out and created a fictionalized version of them? Well, Mr. Justice Fortas, the reason that truth or falsity bears not only on liability in New York courts, but bears on First Amendment is this. In the event that there was a newsworthy event, and if Life magazine had, repub had published accurately, even under a staged situation, the relationship of the Hills to that event, I believe that would raise a grave constitutional question. Because you then get into the point that once you're in the news, <laughs> always in the news, what the New York courts have said here, however, and I think that it is an appropriate distinction, is that once an individual is involuntarily in the news, as was the case with the Hills, involuntarily in the news, as was the case of the Hills, as was brought out a moment ago. Uh, it's ridiculous to believe that he called a press conference and brought his little microphone out from the house. Uh, Mr. Hill and his family, I think it's quite clear, and all the evidence clearly demonstrates that this is a classic case of privacy. Not only did they not seek publicity, they refused to go on the Ed Sullivan show. They refused. Mr. Hill wrote a letter to one author who wanted to write an article and share the proceeds with him, and why? <coughs> Not because they were interested in the price that they were going to get for privacy, but because privacy to them was priceless. That is why defendants attempt throughout this case to downgrade privacy, downgrade it, and to say that invasions of privacy, insofar as defam I mean, false statements with regard to privacy, uh, have a uh, as I understand it, more value, social value, than false statements regarding defamation makes no sense. This, it seems to me, is an area of the law which deserves a paramount measure of protection because certainly it is an area where, like belief, as Mr. Emerson has pointed out in a recent article, it's an area where you have the fundamental problem that confronts all <coughs> Americans today, and that is of how does an individual remain an individual in our mass communication society? But I digress. If I can come to the, again to the point, the reason that the constitutional point is tied in to the falsity is that unless you have the use of false statements for commercial purposes, that then you would have a serious constitutional problem. If it was a true, a true account of what the Hills had done, even though it did invade their privacy. In my view, it would raise questions not only in New York, where there would be no liability, but it could potentially raise constitutional questions. Now, that case is not before this court because the only, there are other cases in other jurisdictions which well, the that is quoted in Reed, Melvin sure. versus Reed, which raises that very point. I'm not entirely sure of that. But uh, suppose uh, you had a current news event and the Life magazine reported it, and they reported it inaccurately. Would that uh, make that uh, report, of, report of that current news event uh, uh, subject to the false or inaccurate report of that current news event subject to the uh, New York statute no. consistently with the First current, Amendment? Mr. Justice Fortas, current news under all the New York cases is beyond the scope of the New York statute. About the constitutional principle. Does it make any difference with respect to impact of First Amendment? That's what bothers me about your 
true-false distinction for purposes of our problem, which is, I take it, to be a First Amendment problem. Suppose a New York statute were construed and applied so as to say that if the current account of a news uh, event is, is inaccurate, the same degree that this Life magazine is arguably inaccurate, then the uh, New York statute says that it's an invasion of the right of privacy. Is the fact that it's inaccurate, even though it's a current news event, uh, make it uh, fall under the ban of the First Amendment? Where it is a current news event, it does fall, it seems to me, under the ban of the First Amendment, and there is a distinction and a very appropriate one that could be made. Uh, what we are talking about here in this whole First Amendment context where this court has been so involved in the past two to three years, what we're talking about here is protecting individual rights, whether it's in defamation or privacy, this new right that is now before this court, while at the same time having a maximum commitment to freedom of expression. Now, in the event that liability were imposed for a current news story, a, for example, a current review of the play uh, using the Hill's name, it would seem to me that that would raise a serious First Amendment problem. Uh, it seems to me that what is involved here in the test of fictionalization, if I may say so, is protecting the right of privacy, but with a maximum commitment to the First Amendment by requiring that there must be a conscious action on the part of the publisher in which he falsely connects the individual with a newsworthy event where he does harm through falsehood. If I could, if I could uh, for Mr. Justice Brennan's benefit particularly, uh, explore that point one bit further. Uh, defendant has suggested as the test for these cases that uh, where we have any connection between the person whose name is used and a past newsworthy event, that that gives an absolute license to lie for the rest of his life. If there is any connection, for example, that means you could take any hostage instance and write about it. Write about it and say that it related to this particular play. I would say that that kind of a test is one that it seems to me meets no constitutional standard. And I would suggest also that it would give a license not to responsible publications like Life magazine, who very seldom make mistakes like this, but to every pulp scandal sheet in the country to take private persons or even public persons who for the moment had been in the public eye, and then years later, because there was some connection with event, fictionalize, lie about them for purposes of trade. And that's why we must understand that life took this article and proceeded to say that this was a reenactment of the Hill incident. Tell me, Mr. Nixon, is there any uh, question here on the sufficiency of the evidence? If I understand you, uh, fictionalization, conscious fictionalization, I think is the case. Yes. Uh, is uh, uh, an essential element of uh, liability under this statute uh, if it's to meet the First Amendment. amendment That's uh, correct. Now, what about conscious fictionalization? Does fictionalization in of itself import a conscious untruth? It is. And is that your position? It requires that. Uh, if I can go on on that point for one second longer. I believe that the test of fictionalization as applied to the tort of privacy is a more appropriate test for privacy cases than the malice test of New York Times and Sullivan as applied to defamation. And I'm going to suggest something now that may surprise the court. I believe that the test of fictionalization as applied to privacy by the New York courts gives greater protection the freedom of the press and expression than does the malice test in the New York Times. Let's look at the differences. 
For fictionalization and for liability to be found, one, the proper name must be used. New York Times, Rosenblatt and Blair, you had a problem with names. You don't have that problem here. Second, it must be primary in the article. That is not a requirement in defamation. Third, the defamation, or I should say the false statements in fictionalization, must affect the essential accuracy of the whole article. Incidental inaccuracy <coughs> is enough in defamation. And fourth, it is necessary that the fictionalization be for purposes of trade, commercial. In per terms of defamation, there is no need that the fictionalization of the false statements were used to serve the commercial purposes of the publisher. May I ask you a now, question about yes, the purposes of trade? Every newspaper is run for purposes of trade, isn't it? Its news is published for purposes of trade. It wants to sell its papers. And uh, I understood, I can't find the charge, but I understood that there was a charge from somebody, from some, I understood from someone, that the charge said that if the newspaper was publishing this in order to increase its circulation, then it was liable, otherwise not. Is that right? Mr. Justice Black, the, the charge does not put liability on that narrow ground alone. But uh, is, that charge, of, is that one of them? No, that, that they, what, what the charge says is that only if the jury finds that, one, that these three factors come together. One, the use of a name in a fictionalized context for purposes of trade. Now, every, how can a newspaper publish anything except for purposes of trade? And that does that cover every news item they have or every editorial? Mr. Justice Black, you will put your finger on the reason why the New York courts have insisted on providing for and requiring the element of false statement or fictionalization. Because otherwise, it is absolutely true that newspapers and magazines publish their art articles for purposes of trade. But what we are saying here is that the purposes of trade test is not met unless the publication fictionalize the plaintiff's connection with the event. In other words, where instead of publishing news about the plaintiff, it published a fictionalized account, which is very different from news. Then as, I understand, as I understand it, that narrows down the statement that under New York law, any newspaper that publishes a fictionalized account, because all of them are just trade, publishes a fictionalized account, it can be held liable under this New York statute. Not unless it invades privacy, not unless there is damage, not unless it is primary, and not unless it is affects but the any essential But any publication accuracy. about a man invades privacy. Excuse me? Doesn't any publication made about a human being affect his privacy? Well, any publication does in the general sense. Mm. But I should point out that in 60 years, the New York courts have been, have followed a very narrow uh, line of definition in this particular field because of their concern for First Amendment problems. Is that an argument that this statute really said there may be liability for a fictionalized version of a new uh, That might satisfy the but New York has added an additional limitation. The limitation being that it must be a fictionalized version for profit. Exactly. It's a fictionalized version for profit. Uh, uh, let, me, let me bring it back to the facts of this case. Well, don't newspapers run for profit? Yes, sir. Uh, and, mis and Mr. Justice Black, unless the New York courts had been very scrupulous in insisting that there be the additional element of fictionalization, I would say that this New York statute would have very great difficulties on a constitutional uh, point. Let me emphasize again that the reason that Life magazine did this is, I think, in the testimony where they say, one of their researchers, it was a good gimmick. They were using these people as props. This was the hoax. They were using them as props for the purpose of making the article more readable and for selling more magazines. Now let me say, if they stated the truth about these people, that would have been perfectly within their constitutional rights. But when what they did was to use them in a fictionalized context for the purposes of trade, 
then certainly this does not present a constitutional problem. Uh, you would answer Mr. Justice Stewart's uh, question earlier uh, uh, in the affirmative. That is to say, if a uh, newspaper just set out and wrote a story based upon some photographs uh, taken of, of uh, the intimacies of uh, a married couple, publish those as a news story, since that's not fictionalized in the usual sense, you would say then that uh, if that were held to be an invasion of privacy under the New York statute, this court should find that the New York statute was applied in violation of the First Amendment. Is that your position? I would say that based on all of the New York cases, and obviously I must uh, limit my answer to those cases over a period of 60 years, that all of the New York cases have held that the element of fictionalization must be present in order to have a violation under the statute. Uh, because fictionalization is the essential element to, pr to prove purposes of trade. No problem, and where you have the, and, and so Mr. Justice Ford, is where you have the element of truth. Truth thereby makes it news. And news therefore brings us into First Amendment problems. That our would be my answer is, to the our question. The problem is to get at the theory of this. Yes. Uh, and uh, so that you would say that Mr. Justice Stewart's uh, example, if I understand the last part of your statement just now, that that could not constitutionally be held to invade the uh, right of privacy. That would be my conclusion. Mm. Mr. Nixon, may I ask you this question? Suppose that uh, <coughs> Light, instead of doing this the way it did, said that uh, <coughs> this play of uh, Mr. Hughes is reminiscent of uh, the Hill incident in, in Philadelphia, uh, which we recall to be as follows. Uh, <coughs> and they, they then proceed to revive the story substantially as it occurred. Uh, would you say that uh, <coughs> no matter how sensitive these people were to their privacy, no matter how hard they had tried to get away from reliving this thing, that uh, that would be uh, appropriate and life could uh, do that without uh, violating your law? It's Chief Justice, cruel as it might be in special circumstances, as it was in the Citus case and yes. in another area, yes. I believe that that would not be a violation uh, under New York law. Uh, it is required under New York law uh, that there be fictionalization, yes. which means that there be uh, huh. a, a conscious staging uh, in a fictionalized context. And in the case that you presented, uh, the article would have had the qualifying phrase indicating that there was a relationship. Let me, let me point out that in the first draft of the article that Mr. Prideau wrote, it was not about, as far as its major theme is concerned, the hills, which was the article you see before you. It was about the play. It didn't have the hills in the text of the article, although it had it in some of the pictures. And it also had, in the first draft of the article, the terms somewhat fictionalized was written into the first part of the article. It happens that when the checker went over the article, as in life's very, very careful checking of the facts, that question marks were put over the phrase somewhat fictionalized. And this brings us back to the question of intent. What happened when that was brought to the attention of not only Mr. Prideau, but of his Editor immediately above me, Mr. Kastner. Did they check with the Hills? No. Did they check with the author? No. What they did was to strike out the word somewhat fictionalized, rewrite the whole article, change the running head of the article so that it, instead of being desperate hours about the play, true crime about the Hills. In other words, they went to the very last limit to identify that play with the Hills and the true incident which certainly bears on the point that this was a fictionalized account and that there was certainly knowledge and at the very least reckless disregard of the facts. And I suppose, <clears throat> Mr. Nixon, that we didn't consider that uh, the fictionalization of the article was the crux 
of the constitutional question, uh, how would you answer uh, the question that I first put to you? Would you think that involved uh, First Amendment rights? If I understand the Chief Justice's question, it is that uh, let's suppose we had a situation where liability were found in the case that you present. Would that involve constitutional rights? Exactly. Yes, exactly. Mr. Chief Justice, uh, I would say it would. I'm referring now not to the New York cases. I'm referring to this whole field of privacy, which will be before this court, I am sure, in times in the future. But what we have here is, is the problem of all publishers. Not publishers just like Time Life with huge staffs and research staffs, but we have publishers uh, that do not have the facilities to check stories as much as others. And I believe that if the lines are drawn too tightly, that you would have a serious restriction on freedom of expression. I think the reason that the New York statute does not present a First Amendment problem is because it has been so narrowly constructed. And I believe the very fact that it is denied recovery in cases like CITES and would deny recovery in the case that the Chief Justice has put, I believe that this answers the fundamental question that has been raised by appellant in this case as to whether or not this case does violate First Amendment considerations. Let's take the case in California that uh, counsel referred Melvin to. Melvin versus Reed? The, the case of the, yes, of yes, the pro reform prostitute. Yes, yes, sir. They wrote that. Uh, do, you, do you consider that that uh, involved First Amendment rights? As the uh, Chief Justice would know, and uh, an individual prepares a case, he concentrates on his own law and his own case. Uh, looking at Melvin versus Reed, recognizing that first in California this was a common law decision. There was no statute in, Cal in, in, in California. And incidentally, there are some other jurisdictions where true do have, cases... Do we have common law jurisdiction out there? I think it's common law jurisdiction. That's my rec... Pardon me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, under the California Code, right. but but, uh, but I would I would say that the uh, as far as this, uh, the the California is concerned, uh, if I could digress for a moment, the California courts recognize the right of privacy under a phrase in the California Constitution providing for the pursuit of happiness, which it seems to me is a fundamentally a sound proposition. But let's get to the point. Melvin versus Reed. Uh, a reformed prostitute, uh, a motion picture years later after she has uh, established a place in a community, dredging up all the facts. True uh, question, does it present a constitutional problem? And I would say here, if I may be so bold, that I believe that if this came before this court, this court would have to apply the, an ad hoc balancing test. Uh, I, I recognize that uh, at this point, uh, whether, whether that test is still valid uh, after recent decisions uh, remains to be seen. But certainly you would have to balance, in this case, uh, the community interest in, in uh, rehabilitating uh, the reformed prostitute uh, against the First Amendment considerations involved in giving to newspapers and television uh, a right to publish things that may be interesting and newsworthy. Uh, this is the problem that would be presented. There, uh, Mr. Justice Brandon is absolutely correct. There were aspects of fictionalization, but they were, if I may use Mr. Benita's term, superficial. They didn't go to the heart of the case. Uh, the, the heart of the case was... Uh, was substantially accurate insofar as the report was concerned. Could I say one other thing with regard to Life Magazine's position here? I want to set the record straight at one point. The appellate in his reply brief uh, points out that, uh, that uh, we, as representing the plaintiff, obviously don't like lifestyle. Now, Mr. Chief Justice, 
That isn't the issue in this case. Uh, I happen to like Life magazine. Uh, and even if I didn't, the fact that it is the most popular picture magazine in the nation indicates that they, they must be doing something right. But on the other point that I would make, the key point here is not lifestyle. The point here is, why is Life the most popular picture magazine? Two reasons. One, because it's newsy. It takes last week's news and makes it interesting. So it has that problem. But two, why is it the most quoted yet in time of all the weekly news magazines? Because it's accurate. Because people can rely on it. Because it's true. Mr. Nixon, and that's what's Nixon, involved in this did case. I, did I understand you earlier to concede that I don't think really that the quality of Life magazine is <laughs> pertinent as I see it. But did I understand you a little earlier to volunteer the statement that Life had carefully checked this story? or that they had a practice of carefully checking? Yes. Mr. Justice Portis, under life's procedure... Did you say yes to my question? So under... Uh, the, the answer is they had checked it to this extent. Under life's procedure, a researcher has the responsibility to read the article and to check each word in the article indicating that she has checked its accuracy. In this instance, each word in the first draft of this article had been... a check mark had been placed over each word but over the word somewhat fictionalized question marks. Well, are point. you conceding here that this article was carefully checked by Life magazine, whatever use, whatever technique they used, except for those two words? Well, it was, it was carefully ch checked except for what is the heart of this case, somewhat fictionalized. And on that, it was not carefully checked. In fact, Life was put on notice by the fact that its researcher indicated it was somewhat fictionalized, that that ought to be checked. And then they failed to make any check at all. They proceeded to go even further in the direction that the researcher indicated they should not well, go. that may leave you with the problem in the event that we don't agree that somewhat fictionalized is the heart of the case. It's correct. Mr. Nixon, is there any reason why we shouldn't have the court's charge before us? Is it accessible? I, uh, excuse me, the sir. The court's charge. Is there any reason yes, why it shouldn't be here in the record? Yes, it is in the record. It is? I didn't find yes. it. Yes. Not the charge I didn't find. I'd like to know where it is, if it is. Uh, page 306, Mr. Justice Black. Would you like for me to read portions of it? Oh, no, that's all right. Fine. Is it all there? Yes, it's all there. And all the, uh, I think Mr. Medina will agree, the whole, all of the charges... From the record. That's true. It begins on page 292, I think. 292. I was reading from yep. the It begins on page 292. Page 292 and following. Do both of you agree that that's all the charge? The gist of the charge, Your Honor, is on page 307, because that portion was repeated no less than six different times. And that's the heart of the charge right yes, there. Yes, but the complete charge is here. The complete charge is in the record. Yeah. Just yes, page 307. It is here. Yes, yes it is. It's 292, the charge no, begins, I, and it I goes over to 307. I also should say that there's an additional punitive damage charge, which comes at page 565 and 566, which was added later. And may I say on the punitive damage charge, uh, uh, appellant in this brief quotes that charge, uh, but, it, but I should add, and I only because it, by inadvertence, was left off of the quote. Uh, appellant points out that, uh, in its quote, that uh, this was done knowingly or through failure to make a reasonable investigation. But the balance of the charge, the punitive damage charge, says you do not need to find that there was any actual ill will or personal malice toward the plaintiff if you find a reckless or wanton disregard of the plaintiff's rights. My point being is that the punitive damage charge was not based simply on failure to make a reasonable investigation. There, it, there had to be the failure to make a reasonable investigation and a reckless or wanton disregard of the plaintiff's rights, well, do you which again that, gets us within the test. Is it your position that that occurred? Are you yes, it is. To us that there was a it is. There was a finding, Mr. Justice Fortas. The, the jury uh, found for the, the uh, plaintiff after hearing that charge, it is my position that there was a reckless uh, disregard of the plaintiff's rights. 
by a reasonable... Reckless and wanton disregard of parents' rights, and that no reasonable investigation had been made, yes. Does that answer the question? Yes, sir. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Nixon, uh, the way you tell us uh, uh, present this New York statute, it's just as though New York statute, as uh, New York has a law which, uh, although labeled privacy, is really a law which gives a remedy for an intentional falsehood for gain and profit. Mr. Justice White, I think you have hit upon a fundamental point, and I would say further. What we have here before this court, as a matter of first impression, is uh, the use of falsity to invade privacy for purposes of profit, uh, and as compared with the use of fals uh, falsity to damage reputation. Well, your adversary said uh, in his argument that uh, he wouldn't have any uh, doubt that constitutionally uh, a state could uh, give, a re give a remedy for, several, for intentional torts, like telling a deliberate lie about a person to his damage. And it sounds as though, uh, although no New York calls it the law of privacy, uh, as I understand you, the, 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 uh, this is almost what this New York law is. The New, York, the New York law of privacy, Mr. Justice White, is a very limited law. Uh, the recoveries for privacy in New York under this statute are far more limited than is the case in most of the jurisdictions, including our state of California. I think it we can't really know how limited it is merely by reading the face of the statute to understand from your argument that case after case has cut it down to its present size. Is that it? Uh, Mr. Justice Brennan, the, the fundamental point that has been made by appellant and which must be considered by this court of vagueness is answered by what has happened over 60 years. Limiting construction. Limiting construction. Uh, limiting, for example, in, including in, in matters that are... Uh, news, a comic strips, uh, a, a comic strip portrayal of uh, the man who was a hero when the plane flew into the Empire State Building. No liability, because a comic strip was considered to be, uh, since it was true, even though it was sensational. It isn't sensationalism alone here. What is involved is fictionalization for the purpose of profit. 